I have a serious problem, I think. I can't stop drinking these things. This drink is called Yerba Mate, specifically the Enlightenment flavor. And they're incredible. It's gotten so bad that I'm ordering a 12 pack off Amazon every two weeks. It's become one of those habits that sort of quietly built itself into my life, like brushing my teeth or checking YouTube studio every three hours. And the thing is, up until now, I've never really thought of it as a bad habit. To be honest, I thought of it as a healthy alternative to what I used to drink. Monster, Red Bull, you know. But recently I've been wondering, is this just a rebrand? If maybe what I think of as my healthy-ish alternative to coffee is actually just a healthy label over the same caffeine addiction that will take me out one day. For context, I started drinking caffeine in college, usually via Monster Energy and those Starbucks bottled coffee things. Y you know what they are. The first time I had a serious kick of caffeine was the first time I can genuinely remember locking in. Suddenly I was typing faster, editing faster, talking faster. From there I shifted to pre-workout powders and shaken espresso drinks. And then eventually I found these guys. And we've been in a long-term relationship ever since. Yerba mate is a caffeinated tea that comes from the leaves of a plant in South America. It's been consumed traditionally in places like Argentina and Paraguay for centuries, often as a social drink. People pass around a gourd and sip through a straw called a bombilla, but mine comes out of a tall aluminum can with a vaguely spiritual design printed on the front which feels slightly less legit. Guyaki, the company behind the drinks, markets itself as the ethical energy drink. The branding promotes that everything is ethically sourced and fair trade, which makes you feel like you're making a good decision, even if you're consuming 150 milligrams of caffeine at 10 a.m. every single day, sometimes without eating breakfast. But what's weird is how easy it is to think of that as normal. Like, nobody ever pulls you aside to say, hey man, I think you're drinking too much yerba mate. If I was doing this with any other substance every day, there'd be an intervention. But because it's just caffeine, no one says anything. It's not a dependency, it's a daily ritual, right? I mean, sure, maybe it's a little true, but lately I've started to notice that if I skip a day, I don't feel tired, I just feel off. Like my whole system is slightly misaligned. I want to figure out how we got here. How did we end up in a society where drinking a drug every morning is considered normal, but only in this one case? What does it say about us? And should I be worried about this little yellow can? I mean, maybe it's fine, but maybe it's a sign of something deeper. Now, before Celsius and G Fuel, caffeine had a much slower rollout, thousands of years slower. Tea, for example, was supposedly discovered in 2737 BC by a Chinese emperor named Shen Nong. There are multiple versions of the story, but my favorite is when the emperor calls for a servant to boil water, to purify it to drink. As the servant makes his way back, a tea leaf falls off a tree and lands in the water without the servant noticing. That discovery, assuming it's totally real, kicked off an entire culture of slow, intentional tea drinking across East Asia. Meanwhile, in Ethiopia, goat herders notice their goats acting strange after chewing on coffee berries. That story gets passed down until, by the 15th century, Sufi monks in Yemen were brewing coffee to stay up through long nights of prayer. So yes, from the very beginning, caffeine was used for focus, for clarity, for staying awake and being productive. But what's wild is how quickly it went from a personal tool to a public revolution. This is where we find the coffee house. The first ones popped up in the Islamic world, places like Cairo and Istanbul. These were hubs of discussion and debate. You couldn't get alcohol, but you could get news, political ideas, and the kind of conversation that would make governments nervous. By the 1600s, these spots were everywhere. Istanbul had hundreds, and rulers got so spooked by how energized and equalizing they were that coffee actually got banned multiple times. It didn't work though, people kept drinking it. Then Europe got a taste. London's first coffee house opened in the 1650s and was quickly nicknamed a Penny University because for the price of a cup of coffee, you could sit down and learn from the smartest people in the city. This is where scientists, merchants, philosophers, and random guys with big opinions all came to talk. They would have made fantastic video essays, and back then you probably didn't even have to ask to like and subscribe. These coffee houses helped launch the Enlightenment, the Royal Society, and even the idea of the stock market. Voltaire basically lived in a cafe. Rousseau wrote manifestos over espresso. Coffee was literally changing how people thought, and it was fueling revolutions. Before 1773, tea was the drink of choice in the colonies. Then came the Boston Tea Party, and suddenly tea drinking became unpatriotic. So coffee stepped in. Drinking coffee became a subtle revolt against the British. Revolutionary groups like the Sons of Liberty met at places like the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, which doubled as a coffee house. Meanwhile, in New York, the Merchant's Coffee House became a hub for resistance planning. So in a way, Coffee helped birth America. All of this set the stage for something even bigger. 
the Industrial Revolution. Once people realized they could brew caffeine on the cheap and stay up later, work longer, and think sharper, it became a whole lifestyle. Coffee breaks became standard, tea breaks became sacred, caffeine became the official drug of the nine to five. Which brings us to today, a world where most people wake up and immediately dose themselves with a stimulant before opening their email. The ritual we all take part in, the Starbucks line, the Keurig pod, the warm yerba mate in the glove compartment, that's probably fine to drink, is the modern version of a centuries old pattern. People reaching for something to stay awake and stay sharp because the world keeps demanding more from us. But where do we draw the line between fuel and dependence? So if coffee was the drink of the enlightenment and the revolution, then energy drinks are the drink of at whatever it is we're doing now, hustle culture, Twitch streams, gym selfies, I don't know. Whatever era this is, it's running on neon colored cans with names like Bang, Celsius, and Ghost. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the rise of energy drinks overlaps almost perfectly with the rise of being online all the time. Let's rewind a bit. The first real energy drink wasn't Red Bull. It was a drink called, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, but just go with me, Lipovitan D. It was launched in Japan in the 1960s. It came in these little tiny brown bottles, had a bitter medicinal taste, and promised to fight fatigue. It's basically the opposite vibe of modern energy drinks. But the same core idea. Here's a liquid shortcut to alertness. Then in 1987, Red Bull was born. Some Australian guy tried a Thai version of Lipovitan, tweaked the formula, and started selling it to Europeans. Red Bull had everything, caffeine, taurine, sugar, and it came in a really sleek silver can. But more importantly, it had branding. It didn't just sell energy, it sold a lifestyle. You know what I'm talking about. Jumping out of helicopters, flying through Red Bull air races, being extreme. By the time it hit the US in 1997, it already figured out its audience. Students, club kids, and anyone who needed to fake eight hours of sleep immediately. Then came the cavalry. Monster, Rockstar, Five Hour Energy. Each brand louder than the last. Each can bigger, or significantly smaller, which is okay too. The caffeine started creeping up. A can of Red Bull has about 80 milligrams of caffeine in it, but then you started seeing the numbers go up to 160, 200, 300. Suddenly you had to check the label to make sure you weren't about to give yourself heart palpitations. It was a caffeine arms race, and it worked. In 2017, the US energy drink market was worth about $11 billion, but in 2024, it passed 21 billion. But something interesting started happening in the 2010s. People got more health conscious, or at least branding got more health conscious. Enter the zero sugar energy drink. Clean energy, natural caffeine. Brands started using words like nootropic, adaptogenic, and plant-based. Energy drinks went from this will keep you awake during your grave shift to this will help you be your best self. And that's where Yerba Mate comes in. Guyaki launched in 1996, but it really started to take off when it rebranded. The company talks about sustainability and indigenous farming practices, but most importantly, the drink works. A can has about 150 milligrams of caffeine, wow. roughly the same as a Monster Energy, but it feels smoother. There's no sugar crash, no jittery spike. It's been marketed as good energy, whatever that means. In fact, Guyaki is now the third fastest selling energy drink brand in the United States, behind only Monster and Red Bull. Think about that. A company that sells canned tea from South American leaves is competing with brands that sponsor NASCAR teams. But here's the catch. Whether it's marketed with a Monster Claw or a Rainforest logo, it's all still caffeine. And for a lot of these brands, more is better. Some of the new drinks hitting 200 and 300 milligrams of caffeine per can are equaling about four shots of espresso in one sitting. And they're marketed directly to teenagers. So yeah, energy drinks got popular because we needed them. Because there's always more work, school, side hustles, there's always something. But they stayed popular because companies got really good at making us feel like it was all under control. Like this little can of chemicals was a smart, healthy, spiritual choice. Whether it's a monster or a yerba mate, it's still a stimulant in a pretty outfit. And the more I think about that, the more I wonder if caffeine is the fuel of our generation, what exactly are we using it to power? Now, let's talk about what this stuff actually does to your brain. Like, biologically, what's happening when I crack open a can of this at 9 a.m.? So, Here's the quick version. Caffeine blocks a chemical in your brain called adenosine. Adenosine is what builds up in your system throughout the day and tells your body it's time to sleep. It's kind of like your brain's low battery signal. Caffeine shows up and hijacks that receptor, which tricks your brain into thinking, hey, we're not actually tired. And for a few hours, you're not. That's the magic. But it's also kind of the lie. Because your body is still tired, 
You've just temporarily cut the wires to the warning system. It's not fixing fatigue, it's muting it. And when the caffeine wears off, all the exhaustion you silenced earlier comes rushing back. That's the crash. That's when you reach for another can. On top of that, caffeine ramps up your adrenaline and dopamine, two things that make you feel good and focused and alert. Adrenaline gives you the energy boost. Dopamine gives you the satisfaction of getting stuff done. It literally changes the chemistry of how your brain experiences motivation. That's why caffeine doesn't just make you feel more awake it makes you feel more capable. But here's the catch. The more you drink it, the more your body adjusts. Your brain starts adding more adenosine receptors to make up for all the one caffeine keeps blocking. That means over time you need more caffeine to feel the same effect. It's called tolerance. And that's when your daily habit turns into dependency. The science says most of us aren't getting a boost above baseline. We're just borrowing energy from our future selves. A 2023 study even found that most of caffeine's benefits are just reversal of withdrawal symptoms. The fog, the fatigue, it's not you being tired, it's most likely you in withdrawal. And caffeine doesn't give you superpowers, it's just bringing you back to normal. Also, quick side note, caffeine raises cortisol, the stress hormone especially if you're drinking it on an empty stomach. So if you're drinking something before eating anything, you're kind of jumpstarting your body's fight or flight mode. You're not nourishing yourself. You're flipping on every alert system in your body and calling it focus. Now, to be fair, moderate caffeine use isn't dangerous. Most health organizations say up to 400 milligrams a day is fine for adults. That's about four to six cups of coffee. And there's actually data showing that long-term coffee drinkers may have lower risks of things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and even certain cancers. So it's not all bad news. Caffeine in the right dose for the right people can be beneficial. But that's the key part, the right people. Some of us metabolize caffeine slower than others. Some of us get anxious. Some of us can't sleep if we have it after 2 p.m. And for those people, even moderate use can mean insomnia, heart palpitations. It also matters where the caffeine comes from. Coffee hits hard and fast. Tea is a little smoother thanks to something called L-theanine, which kind of mellows out the stimulation. Yerba mate is somewhere in the middle. It's got other stimulants like theobromine, which might explain why the energy feels cleaner. Now, energy drinks on the the other hand, often hit you like a truck, especially if there's sugar or added stimulants in the mix. And as we mentioned, a lot of them come loaded with much more caffeine. So yeah, scientifically speaking, caffeine is doing a lot. And most of us are walking around with a brain that's been chemically rewired by it. I'm not saying it's bad inherently, but I am saying we should probably know what we're signing up for because the caffeine isn't just making us more awake. It's training our bodies to depend on it to function, which kind of leads me to a weird thought. If I'm drawn to feel more like me, when I have caffeine in my system, what does it mean for the version of me without it? Is that the real me or just a less optimized version that the world doesn't want all that much? Caffeine might just be the most political drug we talk about, like it's not a drug. Nobody ever says I'm off caffeine right now in the same way people talk about being off alcohol or smoking. But the deeper I looked into it, the more I realized that our relationship with caffeine says a lot about class, capitalism, about culture, and about what kinds of substances we've decided are acceptable. Coffee consumption in America actually maps pretty closely onto political geography. In 2024, a study found that the most coffee-obsessed states, Massachusetts, New York, Washington, California, are overwhelmingly blue. Meanwhile, the least coffee-obsessed states, Mississippi, Arkansas, West Virginia, are red. Now, that doesn't mean liberals like caffeine more. It's probably just a reflection of urban culture, colder climates, and a proximity to Starbucks every four blocks. But still, it's weird how even our drug of choice can reveal something about where we live and how we vote. Compare this to other substances. Think about how hard alcohol, tobacco, cannabis are all regulated. There are age limits, taxes, and advertising bans. Meanwhile, at least in the United States, you can buy three 300 milligrams of pre-workout at 14 years old, no one bats an eye. And that's the thing. Caffeine gets a free pass because it's been grandfathered in. It's been socially acceptable for centuries, so we don't question it. But if caffeine were discovered today and marketed as a stimulant that raises your heart rate and causes withdrawals, it probably wouldn't make it past the FDA. In some places, it doesn't. Countries like Lithuania, Poland, and most recently Kazakhstan have banned energy drink sales to minors. The UK has voluntary bans in major supermarkets. But in the US, there's no federal age restriction at all. Energy drinks can still be sold in the same aisle as juice boxes. The American Medical Association has called for tighter rules, but nothing's changed yet. Probably because caffeine is so deeply woven into American productivity culture that regulating it feels like regulating work itself. Funny enough, the church kind of plays a part in this too. Mormons famously don't drink caffeine or tea. Seventh-day Adventists avoid caffeine entirely. In Utah, one of the most conservative states, caffeine has long been seen 
Satan as taboo. Not because of the science, but because of religious doctrine. And yet, even there, soda is everywhere. It's a reminder that our drug taboos aren't about health, they're about values. And caffeine managed to sneak through that filter by attaching itself to productivity. Now, back to the original question I started with. Should I keep drinking these? Because on paper, it's not the worst habit. I'm not doing drugs behind a gas station. I'm not drinking alcohol to cope with anything. I'm just having a drink every day of something that gives me a little more zip in the morning. But when you zoom out, the pattern does start to look familiar. I wake up tired, I drink caffeine, I feel better, I crash, I repeat. And somewhere in there, I stopped asking why I was tired in the first place. That's the part that bugs me. Not the caffeine itself, but how easily it became the answer to a problem I never really solved. Why am I so tired all the time? Is it because I'm not sleeping enough? Because I'm overworking? Maybe because my last video only got like 400 views and it was really good? Maybe it's all of it. Maybe Yerba Mate isn't the problem. It's just the patch I keep putting over a system that's got different problems. And there's a quote from Michael Pollan that's been stuck in my head. Caffeine proposes itself as the solution to the problem caffeine creates. Because the longer you use it, the more your body adapts and the less it works and the more you need. At a certain point, you're not drinking it for energy. You're drinking it to feel normal. And yet, I genuinely like it. I like the taste, I like the ritual, I like the way it kicks my brain into gear when I need to be creative. There, there's something romantic about it. And I think part of me wants to believe it's okay, that drinking one every day isn't the end of the world, that I can still be in control of it. But I've also been thinking about control more generally. And the fact that I didn't really choose to be a caffeine person, I just became one slowly, passively. And now here I am building a whole YouTube video around this one question because I'm not sure that I can stop. So maybe the real answer isn't yes or no. Maybe the real question is how? How do you build a relationship with caffeine that feels intentional? How do you make sure it's a tool, not a crutch? How do you stop needing it to feel like yourself? I, I think I'm gonna try something. Not quitting entirely, I'm not a masochist, but dialing it back, seeing what happens if I wait a few hours before the first can. Maybe take a couple days off here and there. Not because I hate caffeine, but because I wanna know what I'm like without it. If I can still write, still film, still be me without it. And if I can't, well, maybe that's a video in itself. Hello everybody, I'm just finishing up the edit on this video as I'm recording this, as you can see, and I just wanted to plug this in at the end of this video to tell you how much I appreciate the reception that the last video got on the Democratic Party. I am blown away by how much people are watching, resonating, engaging with it. I think it's super, super cool. And in the near future, I'm thinking of making more stuff along the lines of that, more politically focused stuff, at least for the immediate future. This video has been in the chamber for a while and it's taken a lot longer to make than I thought, but I've kind of been reworking some ideas and reworking what I think um, the videos that I'm putting out can be uh, going forward in the near future. So if this wasn't really your speed and you joined from the last video, do not worry. We have more of that coming along. I don't want to say anything yet, but there's a couple ideas that I have for videos that I want to get out very, very soon for everybody here. So just wanted to say thank you again. And uh, yeah, more in store. Thanks.